Hi, my name is Berkeley Everett, and I'm a K-5 math specialist in Los Angeles, California. I'm the creator of mathvisuals.wordpress.com, a collection of math animations for K-5. to I also work as an edtech consultant, including for Dragonbox, my favorite math app company. Over the past couple of years, I've figured out how to use Apple's presentation software, Keynote, to create animations and printouts that I use in my class. Today, I'd like to show you what I've learned so you can do the same thing in your class. Here's an outline of the session today. Educational philosophy, keynote basics, creating printouts, where we'll talk about essential techniques and see how they're applied while creating playing cards, board games, and posters. Then we'll go over creating animations like the ones you've seen on my website. Before we start, I have a warning based on my own experience. Technology can enhance your strengths as an educator, but it can also enhance your weaknesses. Personally, technology allows me to dream up new ways of visualizing math, and that has helped my students to become better visualizers as well. But one of my weaknesses is unintentionally pushing my students towards my own way of thinking. I'm always trying to make sure that my visuals are tools for opening up my students' thinking, letting them notice and wonder what they see, and not unwittingly creating a prescriptive way of thinking. That's why I like to say a visual should start a discussion, not end it. With that in mind, I want to talk briefly about my educational philosophy. Most of us were taught to believe that being good at math means getting the correct answer as fast as possible. In her excellent book, Tracy Zager redefines mathematicians as people who, among other things, take risks, make mistakes, ask questions, connect ideas, and reason. So what's the teacher's role in this? The wonderful book, Intentional Talk, written by Elham Kazemi and Allison Hintz, goes over specific teacher mindsets and actions that build productive discourse, as well as six different types of math discussions. Two of their guiding principles are, discussions should achieve a mathematical goal, and different types of goals require planning and leading discussions differently. The best visuals I've created are the ones made for a specific group of students at a specific time in their learning trajectory and accompanied by a pre-planned discussion. So, know your goal and plan accordingly. Also, teachers need to orient students to one another and the mathematical ideas so that every member of the class is involved in achieving the mathematical goal. Students love to interact with the teacher, but I'm my best self when I'm facilitating the discussion from the background, redirecting students to one another when they try to use me as the answer key. Joe Bowler's great book, Mathematical Mindsets, talks about the importance of visuals in math. One reason visuals are so great is they lend themselves to low floor, high ceiling tasks. Tasks that are accessible to all, that's the low floor, but flexible enough to challenge everyone, that's the high ceiling. A visual opens up a shared experience. Everyone is looking at the same thing, but interpreting it differently. This diversity of perspective is a key part of building a community of learners who listen to learn from other people's ideas. So what's the easiest way to engage everyone in deep mathematical discussion? Show something mathematical and ask them, what do you notice? What do you wonder? This idea comes from the work of people like Annie Fetter and Max Ray, and you can read more about it online or in Max's great book, Powerful Problem Solving. You can find lots of great resources for noticing and wondering online, and here's a before and after picture from Simon Gregg, shared on his Twitter using the hashtag NoticeWonder. Keynote works on iPad, but I've never used it, so today's presentation is based on the Mac version. A lot of the concepts should transfer, but some of the technical stuff may not. Also, you might see the video speed up in certain spots. That's because I have a lot I want to show you. If something went by too fast, you can rewind or email me for help. Here are the keyboard shortcuts that I'll be using today. These three are the ones I use the most, and they also work for many other software programs. The bottom three will make more sense in context, so I'll show each one of these pictures as they come up. In the bottom right-hand corner of the template that you can download, you can double-click on my name to access the master slide. This allows you to edit one slide that will appear as the background to every other slide in your presentation. If you're going to be printing out on 8.5 by 11, go to the Document tab and choose the custom slide size. You're going to type in 768 by 1024. You might need to adjust your master slide 
uh, to get it to match. Before we go any further, let's go up to the toolbar. You're going to right click or control click and you're going to choose customize toolbar. Make sure you have the tools you need. You can see what I have up here. If there's something else that you think you might need, you can drag it and leave it up in your toolbar. All right, let's create some shapes. I'm going to start with a circle. Now, while I'm expanding this, I'm going to hold down shift to constrain the proportions. There are a lot of things you can edit about it. The color, and I'm going to speed this part up. You can use the eyedropper to choose a very specific color. Save that color. You can change the opacity. And you can add a border, different kinds of borders. I'm going to let you check this out on your own. There are many, many resources online if you're interested in looking at the basics for Keynote. So here's a, a rectangle. Again, if I hold down shift while I expand it, it will constrain the proportions. You'll notice that I have them one on top of the other, and these buttons up here will allow you to choose which objects appear on top or on bottom. That's great if you have lots of different objects. All right, let's say I want to take this picture from the internet. I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to paste it. Now, there's a couple functions you can use. One is the mask function. This button is just like cropping, so I can, I can crop it this way. Uh, I can also double click it to crop. Now I'm going to Command Z to undo, and I'm going to use this alpha button. Watch this, if I click here and I drag it, I can choose which part of the background or which color is disappearing. So I'm able to remove the background if it's a single color or a similar color from a picture. All right, let's say I want to create an evenly spaced array. I've created a circle and I'm gonna make it really small, and this is where uh, it's good to zoom in. Now, if you uh, go up to this corner, you can turn off Auto Center, and it makes it easier to zoom in where your cursor is. Uh, so I always turn that off when I'm working. So I've zoomed in, and I'm going to copy and paste. I'm going to use Command-C and then Command-V to copy and paste it there. But there's an even easier way, and this is going to save you a lot of time. If you hold down Option, you click on it and you drag, it will automatically copy whatever you've selected. So, I can hold down Option, drag, and as you can see, I can also do it with three objects at a time. So I'm going to hold down Option and drag all three. And you can also see these nice alignment lines that are showing up. You could create your array like this, but the spacing might not be perfectly accurate. So I'm going to show you uh, a cool trick. I'm going to delete those, select these three, I'm going to hold down Option, and while I'm pulling this over, I'm holding down shift. So earlier you saw that it constrained the proportions while I was moving it. In this case, it's helping me align my shapes. So now I have eight. I'm going to select all of them, go to the Arrange tab, Distribute, and distribute them evenly uh, horizontally. Now it didn't look like anything changed. It looks like they were already pretty evenly spaced out. So now I can select all of them. I'm going to group them together. And this will make it easier for me to copy. Hold down Option. And I can make as many copies as I want. If you hold down Command and go to the corners of an object, you'll be able to rotate it. While I'm doing that, I'm also going to hold down Shift. And that helps me align it on some of the more common angles. I'm going to move this over, and as you can see, the alignment lines will help me line it up with the other shapes I have. I'm going to use this shape on the left to help me line things up, but right now the alignment lines are not appearing. That's because this one is grouped, so I'm going to click it, I'm going to ungroup, and I'm going to change the color so that we know that those are for aligning purposes only. And now, when I copy this group, I'm holding down Option and dragging it down. You can see those alignment lines appear, and so I know that these are going to be evenly spaced. Okay, I'm going to speed this next part up. Okay, looks good. Now I can delete these, and I have my 8x8 array. I can group it to make it easier to copy, so I can just copy over the whole thing as one object, or I can also ungroup everything to help me easily edit this array. 
I can select specific objects and delete them. I can hold down Command and select multiple objects and delete those all at once. I find that it's really useful to make multiple copies of any object that I'm going to edit in case I make mistakes or if I want to make different versions. So I'm going to ungroup this all the way and I'm going to copy and paste using Command C and Command V. And I'm copying and pasting the slide so that I can go through and I can uh, make a bunch of different versions of this array. Again, I've sped this part up, but you get the idea. Let's say I want to go back to one object. I'm going to select all of them, and then I'm going to hold down Command while I deselect just that object so I can delete everything else. Now, you see these alignment lines appearing, and they're often very helpful when you're trying to line things up. But if they're stopping you from putting your object exactly where you want it, you can hold down Command while you're dragging it, and those lines will disappear. So if I select these and I go up to Arrange, I'm going to be able to align and distribute them evenly. I can click Align, Middle, and they all line up nicely. And I can click Distribute horizontally, and there we go, they're evenly spaced. If I wanted to fit these into this box and have them distributed evenly, I could line up the endpoints like this, select all of these objects, go up to Arrange, Align Middle, and distribute horizontally. That way I can pull them nicely into this box and they fit perfectly. So now I'm going to group these and make them easier to copy. Click group, move it up here, and now I hold down option and drag it to create copies. Another way to line things up is to click on an object or group and use the arrow keys to move it. So here I'm pressing right on the arrow key and it's moving just the tiniest bit. You can also hold down shift and press the arrow keys to move it in larger chunks. All right, let's take a look at the printout template, which I've already set to eight and a half by 11 paper. And I've already included some cutouts. You'll notice that on these cutouts, the edges, uh, the, the, the cards go all the way to the edges. Uh, I like to do that so that it's easier to just cut along the lines and not have to cut anything out around the edges. If you're going to use the double-sided printout, make sure that the back side of the playing card on the right side lines up with the left card on the opposite side, because that's how it comes out when it prints. Here's an example game board that I've created from a table. Here's the table. And just briefly, I'm going to show you how you can start to edit the table to create a path and create your own game board. So I merge these cells. I go to cell and I select this one and I'm going to change the color of that line border to be white so that you can see this path starts to emerge. Uh, I have to say editing the tables can sometimes be tedious but once you have it set up the kids love playing the board games. Another way to do it would be to create shapes and put them into a path and keep in mind that you can also uh, double click and start typing inside of the shapes. Now I'm actually going to undo what I just did because before you make edits, uh, you should create a separate slide. I copied and pasted it. Uh, another option is you can go up to File and you can duplicate the file and that way you can change anything on this version without losing your template. Here are some other printouts you can make. This is a 1 to 120 chart that I've used in my class. Uh, sometimes I will highlight certain columns or rows and ask them what they notice or what they wonder, and they can see the place value understandings. Other times I'll delete numbers from the chart, and I'll print it out, and it could be a puzzle for the kids, or we'll do it together and discuss the patterns. Keynote makes 
creating simple animations extremely easy with a slide transition called Magic Move. So I have my initial slide, I go up here to animate, and it's going to animate the transition. So I click Magic Move, and now I'm going to copy and paste this slide. Almost anything that I change on the second slide will be automatically and seamlessly animated when the slide transitions. I'm going to speed this next part up, but you can change the color, you can change the size, you can change the orientation. And then we go back to the first slide, to the Animate tab, and let's preview what it looks like. Okay, looks pretty good. I'm going to make it a little bit slower. Okay, that's just right. To see what it'll look like in presentation mode, go up to the play button and use your arrow key to move to the next slide. Magic Move also works for text. I'm going to speed the video up here, but I'm going to layer the 8 on top of the 40, and you'll notice that I'm going to create a white fill on the back of the 8 so that it covers up the 0 when I put it on top of the 40. I'm going to copy the 40 and the 8 together, Command C, and then on the next slide, Command V to paste it. And now I'm going to separate it, and it will animate this from slide to slide. All right, let's see what that looks like. Back to Animate, Preview, and it separates. I want to illustrate the decomposing that's happening during this animation, so I'm going to go to one of my old slides. I'm going to copy my number bond, and I'm going to paste it onto the second slide where I can line it up with my numbers. Then I'm going to click on the number bond. I'm going to copy it and paste it back on the first slide, and it's going to keep it in the same place that it was on the second slide. But I'm going to move it down a little bit so that it's going to move up as the slide transitions. Let's see what that looks like. That looks good. I just showed you the transition between slides, but you can also animate objects on one individual slide. So I've clicked one object, so now instead of transition animation, it's a build-in animation for this one object. So I could select Dissolve. Okay, it's going to dissolve in. And for this one, I'm going to select Wipe. And for the word Math, I'm going to have it move in. But instead of from the left, I want it from the bottom. Okay, just like that. I can click play to preview using the right arrow key to move these along and they appear separately. If I want I can go to the button build order and I can choose each one and choose when it happens or if it happens with another one. So I'm going to have these all happen at the same time. So I said with build one, build one is the triangle. Click on the word math and with build one also. That way they'll all happen at the same time. Let's preview. Yep, that's what I wanted. I often find animating individual objects very tedious, and it's hard to line them up and get them just right. And you can't use these animations on individual objects during a transition. So let me show you how to use Magic Move to achieve the same results. I'm going to copy and paste this slide. And then on the first slide, uh, I don't want the triangle to appear, so I'm going to delete it. Math is going to come from the bottom, so it needs to start down here. And I'm going to cover this object with a white square, and that way I can move the white square off the screen to reveal the blue shape. So on the second slide, I'm going to need a copy of that white rectangle. So I'm going to paste it, and I'm going to move it off screen. Then let's go back to the first slide. Go up to Animate, add Magic Move, and there we go. Let's take a look at creating some math animations now. 
In the template that you can download, I've included a 100 array that's ungrouped and one that is grouped. The grouped one is easier to resize and to copy, so here I'm copying it, and I'm going to undo what I just did. And now I'm holding down Shift to resize it. It's a quick way to get the circles the size that you want them. Then you can ungroup it, and you can edit it. So I'm going to copy this array, and I'm going to go to a new slide. And I'm going to paste it here. But I don't need 100. I'm going to have a 6x6 array, so I'm going to delete and move it to this side. For this animation, I'm thinking about comparing two squares and then revealing the squares that are inside of those squares. I'm going to copy and paste this slide. And on the second slide, I'm going to rearrange the dots so that they'll animate moving outwards. to the first slide, add magic move, and there they go. I want my students to compare this to a different array and its movement. So I'm going to copy and paste the second slide, but then I'm going to go back to the first one and grab that array and paste it and move it over to the other side. To make it easier to differentiate during the discussion, I'll change it to red. I'm copying and pasting the third slide to create the fourth slide, and I'm on the fourth slide, and I want to reveal a different square that's inside of this array. So I select these, and I move them down. And I select these. I'm holding down Command while I click to select multiple objects. Now I can move these up. Okay, let's go back to the previous slide, add some magic move, and see what it looks like. Oh, that's not what we want. This happens often if you're using a lot of the same type of object. The computer has trouble figuring out which ones are moving from one slide to the next. However, we can group one of the sets of objects to help make it more clear what's moving from one slide to the next. So I select these, I group them, I'm going to copy and paste this under the next slide, but first I need to delete these that are not in a group. I paste the ones that are grouped, and I move them where I want them, and that should clear up the confusion. Let's go back, and let's preview the animation. Much better. Let's check it out from the beginning. In class, I would ask my students to notice what is the same and different about these two animations. I press the left arrow keys to go back to restart the animation, and the right arrow keys to progress through the animation. OK, time for a tip and a trick. Uh, let's talk about the tip first. If you're creating an animation, sometimes it's easier to start with the end in mind. So in this case, I want to create something that looks like this, where you're counting up from 0 up to 20. And instead of starting from the beginning and, and animating each step from the beginning. I start at 20 and I work in reverse. So I add magic move, I copy and paste it, and then I'm creating the slide that shows 19. So I'm dragging one off. I copy and paste the slide of 19 and I create the slide of 18. And I continue this until I get all the way down to zero. And when I play it back, it's going to show counting up. Now, time for the trick. Oftentimes, you're going to need a workaround to create a more complicated animation in Keynote since it wasn't necessarily built for what we're using it for. So I'm going to show you where I want to take this animation and, and the problem that often occurs and how I fix it. Let's say that I want to stack these so the kids will start to notice how the 5 and 10 structure are similar. 
When I use magic move on this, that's obviously not what we want. And I'll show you how to fix that in a moment. But first, let me show you where I'm going to go after this. The next slide, I'm going to select all of these on the right side. I'm going to hold down Command, and I'm going to deselect the tens frame. Deselect, deselect. That way I can just move these off. I'm going to change them to blue. I'm going to select the dots on the other side, hold down Command, and deselect the tens frame so you can move off just the dots. Okay, this is where I wanted to go. Slide 1, slide 2, and slide 3. But let's go back to this problem that we had. I'm going to label each slide. So this is slide 1, slide 2, and slide 3. I call this the extra slide trick. Right now the problem is between slide 1 and slide 2. So I'm going to make an exact copy of slide 1 and put it after slide 1. But there's going to be no transition effect between slide 1 and slide 2 so that I can group them secretly. And then I'm also going to group the things on slide 2 so that when I magic move between the extra slide and slide 2, it will be smooth. So here I've copied slide 1, but this is actually the extra slide. And then I'm going to group the tens frame. And then I'm going to group this tens frame. And then I'm going to go back to slide 1 and choose None as the transition so that it appears as if nothing has happened when I click Next. Now, onto slide 2, I'm going to group it so that it lines up with the extra slide that I've created. Now let's go back and take a look. I click Play. Now I'm going to click Right. Nothing's going to seem to happen, but then when I click Next again, it animates smoothly because the extra slide and slide 2 both have the grouped tens frames. But now, between slide 2 and slide 3, it fades in and out because it doesn't recognize that those are the same objects. So, I'm going to have to do the same thing that I did but in reverse. Now the problem is between slide 2 and slide 3, it fades in and out. So I'm going to make a copy of slide 2 with no transition effect. I'm going to ungroup them so that when I magic move to slide 3, it shows the animation I want. So here's slide two, I copy and I paste it. Now this is an extra slide. And I'm going to ungroup these so that when I play it, it's a smooth transition. Don't forget that between slide two and the extra slide after it, there should be no transition. Okay, let's go back and see what it looks like. And there we go. One last little piece of information you should know is that the curved lines will always fade in and out between magic move transitions. So instead of creating a curved line this way, let me show you a different way. You can create a regular line and right click on it and click make editable and these little dots will appear and you can move them around to change the shape of the line. These will act normally during a magic move transition. I highly encourage you to join Twitter if you're not already on there. You can use these hashtags to find more inspiration for math visuals and to share your own. They can be helpful to classrooms across the world. Kyle Pierce makes a lot of great keynote animation videos. You can find them on his website. And Steve Wyborny makes a lot of great PowerPoint animations, which you can also find on his website. Thank you so much for joining me today. You can connect with me on Twitter, you can email me, and I'd love to see what you come up with. Thanks a lot.